Any questions about, I don't know, last time, homework, life in general, etc. Nothing. Yeah. Uh, so you're saying when you get to the end of the reference trajectory? Yeah, so what I would do there is put the sort of desired, basically what you're always doing there in the reference is you're, you're putting in where you want the thing to be at that time, right? So at the end of the trajectory, you want it to be at the goal state, right? So pretty much what you should do is just put the goal state in to fill out the rest of the horizon if you're past the end of your reference trajectory, because that's where you want it to be, right? So, so there's a few things going on. So you have a reference trajectory, right? That takes you from your like initial state to some goal state. That's a certain length. And then you have an MPC horizon, right? Which is like some shorter time horizon. So what you want to do, right? Is like the MPC thing is looking ahead. So it might be taking a chunk out of that reference, you know, that's moving as you move forward in time. And so cool, you're just indexing into that reference trajectory, pulling out whatever, you know, piece of it is at the time you're currently at and like looking ahead. When you get to the end, as the MPC horizon is longer than the end of that reference, like the idea is you want to get to the goal at the end of the time, right? So, you know, if the MPC horizon is now shifted past there, like you still want to be at the goal, right? So you just kind of can pad it out with the goal state for the whole rest of, of the horizon if it's past the end of the reference, right? Does that make sense? Cool. Yeah. Yeah, so you, you have this whole prediction horizon and that's, you're computing a whole control trajectory over that horizon. You actually only execute the first one on the system at each time step. And then you recompute uh, at every step. Yeah, so that's, that's how it works. So is there like a discussion about this interpretation of Yeah, I mean, like basically the, the whole idea is, you know, it is, it is computationally way more expensive than a simple like, you know, feedback policy, um, but generally can achieve, if you can do things with MPC that you can't do with, you know, more simple feedback policies, namely you can explicitly handle constraints right? and there aren't too many good other ways to do that. And, you know, it comes down to if you can solve it fast enough online, then cool, go for it. Um, if you have, there are many, many games that people play to try to reduce the computational cost of MPC. So you can run it on larger systems, longer time horizons, things like this. And there are a lot of games you can play, various approximations, there's a whole like literature on, on this kind of stuff. But it all comes back to the fact that like, you know, if you had infinite compute, you would just solve the whole problem every time, right? But um, like the length of your horizon and all these other details, they end up being constrained by how much compute you have. Yeah, if you had infinite compute, like you wouldn't even bother with the, the receding horizon, right? You just solve it all the way to the end every time if you could, right? Okay, anybody else on that kind of stuff? You could do that too, yeah. So the, the idea that Brian's talking about, there's this idea called explicit MPC, which is like, in principle, I could compute uh, the MPC solution for like every possible state offline ahead of time and just cache it in like a giant lookup table. This is called explicit MPC. It turns out like you can actually do a pretty good job of this for linear, for the sorts of problems you would solve with a QP, like linear dynamics, linear constraints. Turns out the solutions of that are piecewise linear or piecewise affine. And so you can actually build a giant like lookup table thing um, explicitly for, for like um, linear systems but the size of the lookup table blows up pretty quickly, which is why you don't do it. And often it's better to just use the QP solver, but there's lots of in-between ideas, um, you know, that sort of like do a little of both. Anybody else? Uh, so I know MPC is able to like anticipate things yeah. better than other people. Yep. Like yeah, there's one on the rocket problem okay. on the homework. Yeah, try it out. There's some fun, uh, Specifically, you'll see like there's instances yeah, where you can anticipate things and sort of like wind up ahead of time to 
to uh, you know anticipate rather than purely reactive behaviors. So you'll see this again, yeah, in this example, like specifically when you get to the end of the horizon where you should be sort of like staying at the goal, you'll see some weird stuff happen there with LQR where it's sort of, you know, overshoot, undershoot behavior kind of stuff because it's purely reactive, right? It doesn't have this look ahead, whereas MPC will like anticipate that and do a better job. So yeah, good, good call. All right, anybody else? All right, cool. So we'll get into it. Oh yeah, apologies also about like missing flaking out of my office hours this morning. I had a little bit of a crazy day with uh, pow multiple power outages at my house and uh, two-year-old uh, childcare issues <laughs> that compounded the power outages. So um, if anybody still wants to catch up who I missed this morning, uh, let me know and we can set something up this week. Uh, okay, so let's get into it. So last time, we kind of talked about um, like sequential quadratic programming, direct collocation, this set of ideas pretty much, right? And um, those are sort of the other major family of offline nonlinear trajectory optimization sort of techniques that get used a lot. The other one being like these DDP IOQR type methods. Um, today, I want to do a couple things. So the, the first thing I want to do today is kind of do a little bit of a recap of like all the algorithms we've talked about so far. We're kind of reaching the end of a, a, a sort of chapter in this whole discussion, I think at this point where we've talked about, we started you know, out talking about generic optimization stuff. And then we went into what we call deterministic optimal control and talked about you know, LQR and PC and then this nonlinear stuff. So we're kind of reaching the end of that like classical deterministic optimal control conversation. So I would, we're going to kind of do a recap of, of all the stuff we've talked about so far. Um, uh, we'll call it like algorithm recap, maybe. And then um, we will do, uh, yeah, sort of like some pros and cons and decision tree kind of stuff about that. And then we're going to start a new thing, which is a little bit quirky and very much a robotic slash me thing. Uh, we're going to talk a bunch about attitude 3D rotations and like how to optimize things when you have floating base robots, flying robots, underwater robots, space robots, anything that has like a floating base and can rotate in 3D, which does all kinds of weird things. And we're going to talk about that in, in some depth next. Um, which is not necessarily a classical optimal control thing, but it's a very practical thing that shows up a lot in robotics. So specifically things like, you know, rotation matrices and um, quaternions. Who's played with quaternions before? Show of hands, like most of you. Is this stuff that gets covered in KDC some, to some extent a little bit? Yeah, so at least you've you've heard of this stuff and like seen a little bit of it. So we're basically going to talk about how to do Newton's method on quaternions. Is kind of at the the root of it. Okay, cool. Um, so here we go. Um, so basically, yeah, to kind of, I had some questions about like kind of the like decision tree of when to use the stuff we've talked about so far. So here's kind of, I guess my, we're gonna split this up into two sections. The first section would be um, problems that are uh, have linear dynamics or you're trying to do some local control where you can linearize the dynamics. So this comes down to like, you know, either it really is linear, which is kind of rare, but has, happens occasionally, or you have some kind of local, you know, thing where you're trying to track a reference or you know stabilize a system near an equilibrium point. So we'll call this linear or local control problems. And what I mean by local is, you know, linearization works. Okay, so in this setting, this is kind of the first stuff we talked about. 
And we can, I think for this, we can do a little kind of decision tree thing. So the first question is, do you have constraints? And when I say constraints, not the dynamics, right? Anything besides the dynamics, so control limits, uh, obstacles, that kind of stuff. So first question you ask is, do I have constraints? And depending on the answer to this question, uh, so if the answer to that is no, then you can use LQR, which is basically a closed form solution. If the answer to that is yes, you have to worry about some sort of constraints online that are important. Then you're talking about doing MPC. And then from there, there's a couple other sort of things to ask. Are you solving a tracking problem? Meaning you have a trajectory that you're trying to follow in time, or are you trying to stabilize an equilibrium point or a fixed point? So if you ask that question, then on this, on this LQR side, so if you're tracking, that's time varying LQR. And if you're doing sort of stabilization or just trying to stay you know, in one spot, that is classic time invariant LQR with a constant gain matrix. So we'll just call that, usually we just call that LQR, but we'll call it TI LQR for now. So that's where, you know, the difference there is if you're tracking a trajectory, you have a time varying K that's following the trajectory basically. If you're trying to just stick in one spot and stabilize, then it's just a fixed K, right? We're good with that. Okay, and then on the MPC side, this lets you handle inequality constraints like your torque limits and potentially, you know, other state constraints, safety constraints. And here, the big deciding factor is um, what your constraints look like. So if they're linear inequalities, you have a QP, which is super nice and convenient. And this is sort of bad. So then here you're, you have a QP, and this is you know basically, I would say like the bread and butter of like modern control on robots. Like basically everyone's doing QP based MPC on all the cool robot demos you see now. Um, so that's like very well understood, very fast, very easy. If you have um, then the other option are like things that are less common but doable and and kind of currently interesting are if you have conic constraints or kind of the other major type of constraint that you can handle in this kind of setting. And this is, uh, would be like a second order cone program that we talked a little bit about. And there are lots of applications for that from like rocket soft landing to, you know, friction cones on legged robots and stuff. Um, and it's like still kind of researchy and people aren't really doing it too much. Mostly people do QP stuff, but those are kind of the things you can do. Um, any questions about this? setup. So it's sort of like if you have a problem where you, you have linear dynamics or you're linearizing the dynamics to do tracking control, this is basically the decision tree to go through. And probably one of these four things is the answer for online control. Okay. So then the other category of stuff we talked about is, yeah. What do you mean by that? Like the variables which appear, like let's say a TXDD, and X would be an essential variable. But let's say you do not have a variable which appears on the left, left side of the differential equation, then that should be like an algebraic variable. So uh, can you make that distinction for me in like the problems we've been doing in the class? Okay. Basically, every problem we have, we have states and controls, right? And that's it. I don't think there's any other. I mean, you, you can do other things, but generally speaking, for these optimal control problems, your decision variables are the states and the controls. And you can put control, you can put constraints on any combination of those you want to. And if they're linear or conic, you can do this sort of nice convex MPC stuff. If they're more general and weird, then you're in sort of a 
more general nonlinear constraint setting where it's harder potentially. Um, I don't know if you have, if there's something else that I'm not getting. They start out that way, but they don't have to be. So like in particular, everything we've done in this class is this very kind of generic discrete time dynamics model, like XK plus one equals F of XK UK. That's what we've been using for all the control algorithms, right? So that is super generic. It can be literally anything. Can be, you know, can be derived from a set of ODEs for like a, you know, a rocket or a robot or a chemical process or I don't know, whatever you want, or it can be from something that actually is discrete. Um, like there, I mean, there are plenty of examples of that too. Um, they, it can be anything. So there's, it's super generic. It doesn't necessarily, it doesn't even necessarily correspond to some ODE that we discretized. It could be some inherently discrete process as well. So it's pretty broad. Um, and there are lots of processes that like can't quite be written down as ODEs that can be actually dealt with in that discrete time framework. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I think just think about it as states and controls and don't worry about too, like the details of like, if it comes from an ODE or not, it doesn't really matter for us. Okay, so there's this linear stuff or tracking or local stuff. And then the other stuff we talked about next after we did MPC was sort of nonlinear um, trajectory optimization. Um, and this could be, you know, slash planning, maybe. If you're doing it offline, it's called planning. If you're doing it online, it's called MPC, you know, it's fuzzy. Um, okay, so we're going to be, and basically, Basically for us, this comes down to the, the two main types of algorithms for this that we talked about were uh, DDP and dirt call or direct collocation. You might hear people talk a lot about in this field, like classically for sure, direct methods and indirect methods. And honestly, no one quite knows what that means. And it's a little, the definitions are fuzzy. And I kind of hate those terminologies because they like, they're A, ambiguous, B, no one, everyone disagrees on what they mean exactly, and C, most of the algorithms can be derived from either perspective anyway. So I feel like it's a terrible taxonomy. Other people will disagree with me on this, but you know, there you go. So instead, we're just gonna talk about direct collocation and DDP, because those are like the two most popular, most widely used algorithms. Direct collocation classically is a direct method and DDP is classically considered an indirect method, but the lines are blurry and so we won't really worry about that distinction too much. So we're just gonna compare, um, Beer call and DDP. And this one is a lot fuzzier than the nice decision tree story that I had for the other one. So here we're just going to kind of make a table of pros and cons because I don't think I can do the decision tree thing. So here we go. Some comparison. So first, um, uh, direct collocation, as we kind of talked about, you are, you're writing down the dynamics as equality constraints in the optimization problem rather than doing a forward rollout. So in Durkhal, you're only gonna respect the dynamics at convergence of the solver to, at, a, at a solution, right? If you're, if you're not converged to a solution uh, to the KKT conditions, you're not necessarily obeying the dynamics. So that's one. Uh, and then DDP, as we talked about, you do this rollout, so you're always dynamically feasible. Uh, so the other side of that is that because of this sort of dynamic feasibility thing, um, spun it the other way, it, with Durkhal, like we saw last time, you can supply a made up dynamically infeasible guess like cartoon trajectory that doesn't obey dynamics, but that might get you closer to the solution. And therefore you can use that to warm start and get yourself, you know, potentially faster convergence and things like that. So that can be a, an advantage as well. Whereas with the DDP stuff, you can only 
provide an initial guess on the controls, and then you have to roll it out with the dynamics, and that you know doesn't necessarily work super well. If you have, particularly if you have like a really super nonlinear, high dimensional, you know, dynamical system, it can be really hard to get yourself like a reasonable initial guess this way. Okay, so then uh, on the Dirkle side, we can basically handle arbitrary constraints, like anything you want, you can just throw in there. Um, whereas with DDP, you have to do some extra stuff to do constraints. So we talked about this, you can use like hacks, like squashing functions and things like this on the controls. And you can do penalty things for state constraints, or you can wrap the whole thing in augmented Lagrangian, which is a reasonable thing, but you got to do something kind of extra. So it's a little more difficult and potentially, you know, numerically challenging. Okay, what else? Um, so on the DDP side, remember uh, when we do the backward pass of DDP, we're doing basically a Riccati recursion. So, and you get these feedback K matrices and we talk about um, at convergence of DDP, the K matrices that come out of that backward pass, like your last backward pass are the exact same Ks you would get from a time varying LQR. So you basically get a tracking controller out of it for free, which is pretty cool and really nice actually in an online setting where you maybe can't solve your MPC problem fast enough, you can basically use the K matrices in between solves to sort of fill in the gaps between, like if you try to do MPC, but it took say like 10 seconds to solve, um, in between solves for that 10 seconds, you could do tracking uh, with the K matrices from the last one, right? So that's kind of a cool thing. You have this free tracking controller with um, DDP. You have to do uh, do that separately. Although there's some, it's not completely true. There are some tricks to be played there as well. Um, okay, so then back to so DDP generally is known for being really fast. That's the main advantage and why you might like to use it. It has super fast, at least local convergence. Um, the direct stuff um, also can be fast, but typically it's not as efficient or fast. Um, let's see, then sort of similarly, um, the DDP stuff, super efficient and, um, also very memory efficient and pretty relatively easy to implement on an embedded system. So this is the kind of stuff that's like nice to do online. And yeah, then on the like Dirk Hall side, it's it's difficult to do the, that sort of thing, um, mostly because you need a sort of large scale SQP solver. And those are hard to do well. It's hard to implement those well. And there's, it's like, it's just harder to do in general to, to do that on an embedded system. Uh, and then lastly, so Dirk Hall, um, you're using these large scale NLP solvers like SNOP and IPOP that we talked about. These are sort of industrial strength solvers. They're really robust. They have like very good numerical properties. So they tend to be, you know, pretty solid um, and sort of numerically robust. They do lots of smart rescaling tricks under the hood and, and things like this too. Um, mitigate like round off error with floating point math and stuff like that. Whereas the DDP stuff can, like, as we talked about, it has ill conditioning issues potentially um, if you don't scale your variables well. And um, particularly if you're doing some kind of like hacky penalty based 
uh, constraint thing, it can get really bad really quickly. Also, it becomes numerically unstable with really long horizons, a la you know, vanishing, exploding gradient, tail wagging the dog, you know, kind of issues. So not as great there. By the way, it might not have been uh, super clear from, from before. Like we, we talked about these like tail wagging the dog, you know, kind of issues. Those issues basically um, are not present in, uh, in these direct methods. Like they use large scale sparse matrix factorizations that are stable and stuff like this. And because of the way they're set up, you're not backpropping through the whole trajectory. So they don't actually have, they don't have those issues. They're like way better for like long trajectories and you know, poorly scaled problems and stuff like that. Um, okay, so then some final like kind of summary points. Um, as we've been saying, um, DDP is often a good choice for like fast online real-time kind of stuff where you can do a bunch of, you know, tuning of your problem formulation and stuff like this um, and just get it to go really fast. Uh, you know, where you, where speed is kind of critical. And maybe you don't care so much about super accurate constraint tolerances. Um, so that, and then, um, Durkal, this large direct methods, they're probably a good, they're often a good choice for offline trajectory design kind of problems, especially if you have long horizons, super nonlinear constraints, things like that, that are hard to do with DDP methods. Okay, I think that's kind of the summary of stuff we've done so far and like when to use which things. Anyone have any questions on this sort of general set of topics? Yeah. So um, those are indirect methods and actually DDP is a shooting method. So DDP is actually, technically speaking, DDP is a single shooting method, right? But shooting refers to the forward rollout. That's what shooting means. Has everyone, anyone heard of this, these ideas, single shooting, multiple shooting before? And so that just means the, that's the old, old school optimal control word for what we would RL people now call rollout. Same thing, shooting, I guess, because they were aerospace people, think about rockets and stuff like that. Um, I think rollout's kind of a generally friendlier word. Anyway, yeah. So what is like the limit of what you can do with like, what is a good like, set of like, strong interesting factors you can the linear stuff, I mean, it's really, really useful because you can linearize any nonlinear system. So usually what you do is online, closed loop, real time stuff. The real like in the, in the loop online stuff is usually linear um, because you can do it really fast and you can guarantee that the solvers will converge on these convex formulations. Um, you basically wanna do the linear stuff if you can get away with it because it's usually more reliable, more robust and faster. Um, and, if, and you can get away with it a lot of the time. Like it's surprisingly good and like works surprisingly often. I would say like almost any situation, like literally anytime you're doing reference tracking, like if you have a, a, a trajectory that was designed ahead of time, which can be anything from like a rocket landing or like for walking robots, it's a gate, right? So you, you can design a gate for a quadruped offline and then online you're just tracking that reference, right? So anytime you're doing reference tracking, 
where there's some nominal thing you're trying to do um, and you're just trying to stay close to the reference and track the reference, you just linearize around the reference. And as long as you get, don't get knocked too far off, the linearization stays pretty good. And the reason this works, right, is at the end of the day, the controller is trying to keep you on the reference, right? So the controller is pushing you towards the reference where the linearization is good. So if the controller is working well, you will stay within the you know, kind of neighborhood of the reference where the linearization is good. So that kind of works out. Um, so yeah, linear control is surprisingly effective. Like it works incredibly well. LQR is great. MPC is, is super great. And a lot of the stuff you see, you know, awesome, compelling things on robots. The online real-time part of it, this running on the robot is probably linear. It's probably some, it's probably, today it's probably like a QP based MPC. Um, that's what, like basically what SpaceX is doing. That's what Boston Dynamics is doing. That's what MIT Cheetah is doing. Like name a cool looking robot demo you've seen. It's probably doing linear MPC. So you have kind of the other way. What cannot do? Like yeah. So when you can't do that, is like getting the gate, getting that ref. So if I want to make Atlas do a backflip, if I already have the backflip trajectory and I want to go run it on the robot and I just need to track it, I can linearize about that backflip reference trajectory and do linear stuff. But if I'm starting from scratch and I need to figure out how to like generate the backflip trajectory from scratch, given the robot dynamics and whatever, that's super nonlinear, right? And I can't, like, I have nothing to linearize about, right? So now you're in nonlinear territory and that's when you do this nonlinear trajectory optimization stuff. And that's pretty standard pipeline, like for trajectory design, like reference design, gate design, whatever you want to call it, that, that phase is typically done offline and using lots of nonlinear kind of stuff. Then when you go online, it's usually a linear thing where you've linearized about the reference. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, let's see. So what are good examples of this? Um, I mean, most often for like our kind of applications in robotics, the nasty stuff is usually in the dynamics, but there are lots of examples, like, um, like a very trivial one would be if you had like a, like a bunch of obstacles that you needed to avoid hitting. Like say you wanna fly a drone through a forest and you've got like a whole bunch of trees, right? Um, those are non-convex. So for, the, for our purposes, right? Um, the free space has to be convex. So as soon as you stick like a cylinder in the middle of the room that you have to avoid, that's a non-convex constraint. And if you put a bunch of them out there, it starts to get pretty ugly. Uh, like imagine the free space looks like Swiss cheese, right? With all these you know places you're not supposed to go. So that's like, I don't know, a pretty trivial example that shows up fairly frequently. That's those are non-convex constraints that you couldn't handle at least out of the box easily with um, with convex MPC. You'd have to do some, you know, massaging. Uh, what else? Um, I don't know. There's sort of you can you can invent you know complicated goal region constraints. You can invent complicated like safety constraints that involve you know like actuator saturation in certain situations or like um, one that shows up in our lab, we do aerospace stuff. So we work on one of the projects we have is entry vehicles for like landing on Mars. And there you have actually really complicated constraints having to do with the heating of the vehicle as it goes through the atmosphere, which is a very nonlinear function of like the state and stuff like that. So yeah, I mean, it can be, but yeah, like safety constraints, you know, keep out regions can be weird. Um, that's sort of the flavor, I guess, where it can be yeah, like stuff that isn't linear or conic, right, basically. Yeah. Okay, I have two questions. So the first one is, can you go over again? Sorry, sorry. What's the definition of field condition? Um, basically, like, so the technical definition is like a matrix that has a large condition number, which means very close to being singular or non-invertible. Um, so this happens often if you're, so when you solve like all these things, we do Newton's method where we have to like solve a linear system and like invert a matrix basically. Mm -hmm that matrix can become ill-conditioned. And what that means is it's like numerically close to being singular and like non-invertible. When that happens, your answers are really bad, like not accurate. Is it the same as being defective or not? Uh, I don't know what that word means in this context. I don't know what a good technical definition for that. Uh, and the other question I have is, can you can you go uh, over an example of multiple shooting? Yeah, so we haven't really talked about it. Basically what multiple shooting is, is, um, so, sorry, just to go back to the ill-conditioning thing really quick. Is it clear? So like, if you have a matrix 
you can talk about its rank, right? And when we say it's rank deficient, not full rank, then it's non-invertible, right? Yeah. So what ill conditioning is all about is when you do stuff with floating point arithmetic, you can't actually give a sharp rank mm -hmm. because everything's a little fuzzy because of floating point round off and stuff like this. So ill conditioning is basically a soft version of like the idea of being rank deficient or, uh, or singular. Mm -hmm. It's a soft number that measures how close you are to being singular. Um, oh, okay. Well, does that make sense? Yeah. So if your ill condition means your matrix is like close to being singular, which means it behaves badly in a computer with floating yeah. point round off. Yeah, I think it's the same term. Because you know when we do SVD on a matrix? Yes. And we see how the last uh, of the like the middle of the matrix is sometimes like yeah, I know that you can know that. Yeah. So what the way you measure this ill conditioning thing, the technical definition of condition number is the ratio of the largest to smallest singular value. Exactly, yeah. yeah, so exactly. basically it's saying, you know, they're never exactly zero in floating point arithmetic, but if they're close to zero, you know, it means you're close to being singular, right? Exactly. So yeah, good, so I think you get that. Okay, so then multiple shooting, we didn't really talk about it. It's kind of an older thing that isn't super popular right now anymore. What it basically is, is so we talked about, you know, DDP and these indirect methods, shooting methods, whatever you want to call them, you do this forward rollout. For the whole horizon, then you do this back propagation. And then we talked about direct method, like direct collocation. You are um, every time step you have dynamics constraints gluing the you know the time steps together. So there's actually a continuum there in between. So direct collocation, you have a dynamics constraint across every single set of knot points. DDP, you have a long rollout of the whole horizon. Multiple shooting is the in-between where basically you can do DDP style rollouts over subsections of the trajectory and then glue those subsections together with equality constraints like you do in your call. So it's basically in halfway between, you're doing like rollouts for subsections of the trajectory and then gluing the rollouts together at the boundaries. So why might you want to do that? Anyone know? So with this ill conditioning story, you get worse and worse the longer the horizon length is. Uh, this this whole story. So if I make the horizon shorter, I have less ill conditioning. So if I do multiple shooting, I basically take my DDP rollout, say, and I break it up into, say, 10 pieces. Now my condition number is much better, like by a factor of 10, probably. So that's why. Um, that's one reason why. The other reason you might do this instead of just going to direct collocation is that um, your problem size can be smaller because in direct collocation, all the states and all the controls are decision variables. Whereas in DDP, you're only optimizing over the controls, right? Yeah, so it lets you basically tune, there's a knob in between direct collocation and, and sort of DDP. That's what multiple shooting is. But yeah, generally speaking, people don't do this so much anymore. Sure, anybody else? Yeah. So DDP has issues with those conditioning. Yeah, it's really fast. So like, why? My, my understanding is that ill conditioning usually slows down. Yeah, it usually makes things worse. So, so this is modulo, like if it works, it works really fast. If you're super ill conditioned, it's not going to do well, obviously. So it's basically incumbent on the user to like set their problem up and scale variables well in order to make it work well. I don't know if that hopefully answers that question. Yeah, if it's super ill conditioned, it's not going to do well, obviously. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? Everybody good? Okay, cool. So now we're going to uh, take a, a bit of a boondoggle through like a, a very different topic, which I know won't be useful to the like chemi ECE types, but this is a robotics class, I guess. So, you know, this is actually closely related to like complex phaser ideas though. So it's got some like, there's something there. You might get some use out of this if you, if you think hard. Okay. so. Um, why are we doing this? Well, tons of robotic systems, you know, have large rotations. Um, um, like they do this, you know, as part of their normal operation. So like some examples would be quad rotors, which we kind of talked about a little bit, airplanes, spacecraft, which is where most of these ideas originally kind of were developed, underwater vehicles, 
uh, and legged robots. So these things, basically anything floating base, anything that isn't an industrial arm that's like bolted to the world some way. Um, so, so, you know, it is useful. You will see this anytime you kind of do these kind of floating base things. And then sort of my own personal pet peeve is like lots of people use uh, very naive methods for dealing with this stuff. In particular, people often use Euler angles and things like this, and those are terrible and you should not use them. Um, and I'm gonna teach you how to do it the right way. So like angle-based things are bad generally. Um, these things, people have seen this before. Does anybody know like what I mean by singularities with Euler angles? Anyone wanna give us a good definition of what I mean by that when I say Euler angles have singularities? You guys talked about this before. Anybody? Anybody know what I mean? Did you? Uh, yeah, there's a few ways to think about it. So specifically the singularity thing refers to the kinematics. So when you talk about Euler angles, right? If you're trying to like integrate the equations of motion for something, you have to go from angular velocity into Euler angle derivatives, right? And there's some Jacobian, kinematic Jacobian that does that mapping. That Jacobian becomes singular in a bunch of places um, is one way that this shows up. And that's specifically what the singular thing refers to is the kinematic, the kinematic singularities where the Jacobian that maps whether angle derivatives into angular velocity sort of does bad things. There's also in some of these parameterizations, they, the definitions actually blow up. If there's infinities floating around, like divide by zero issues. So that kind of stuff. Um, and this is a real thing. Like people often try to hack this stuff, but there are like many, many engineering examples on real systems where like things crashed and blew up because of like these kind of angle singularity issues. So, so Euler angles bad, don't do Euler angles is the, the summary. Um, then like kind of the, the alternatives, right? That everyone, you know, in here probably knows about are rotation matrices. Rotation matrices are good. They always work. Um, the reason we don't always use them is that they're super over parameterized. There's like nine numbers or at least six unique numbers you have to keep track of for only three degrees of freedom. So that's like a lot of overhead. Um, Um, and then the other option are quaternions, which are the ones that are super common in computer graphics, aerospace, robotics, et cetera. And the reason they're sort of more popular for dynamics -y things than rotation matrices is they only have four numbers instead of nine, and therefore only one constraint to worry about to do your three degrees of freedom. Uh, but these guys are both singularity free. Um, but optimizing over them, like having a rotation as a decision variable in an optimization problem, like a trajectory optimization problem, you got some extra weird things to worry about. Um, so we'll talk about that. Okay. Let's see, any questions so far? Good. Okay, so first question is, what is attitude? So when we talk about attitude, I mean like kind of, you know, in a robotics context, say it's the rotation part of a robot's pose, right? Can anyone give me a tight uh, definition for attitude? Like a nice distinct mathematical definition for what attitude is? I'm gonna give it a try. So it's it's something involving rotation. You can parameterize it by a quaternion rotation matrix or angles, whatever, but what rotation is it specifically? You gotta pick, it's a rotation from some frame to some other frame, right? 
that's what it is. So there's sort of a standard definition in robotics and, and aerospace engineering and most engineering fields. That's pretty, you know, does anyone have any thoughts on this? No, okay. So the standard definition, it is the rotation between a body fixed coordinate frame, i.e. the torso of your robot say, and some inertially fixed lab world kind of frame. Does that make sense everybody? So it's the rotation from the body of the robot to the world frame. So let's see, we'll, I'll draw a cartoon for this. So let's say we have some world frame, looks like this, and it's got, um, we're gonna use ends for the world frame unit vectors. So we'll have like, um, say X, N, Y, N, Z, N, and I'm gonna use left superscripts to keep track of frames. That's sort of a fairly standard convention. And then say we've got some, you know, some robot thing over here with a, a frame attached to it. And we're gonna use Bs for that for body. So X, B, Y, B, Z, B. And by the way, the, the N for inertial frame is Newtonian, N for Newtonian. So the rotation between this, that rotates a vector from that B frame to the N frame is our rotation, is, is say a rotation matrix we'll call Q. And that is the attitude of the body. That's what we call attitude. And it's specifically, you know, such that V, N, some random vector, equals Q times VB. So let's say I have, I don't know, like a, uh, say I have a sensor that's on the robot body um, at a certain spot, right? And I have some vector that I measure. Let's say I have a camera and I have some, uh, something that I measure in the camera frame that's bolted to the body. That's, you know, some point out in the world. And I measure this vector in the body frame of the robot from the camera. If I want to then figure out what that is in the, in the world frame, I apply this rotation to put it in the world frame, right? From the camera frame. Cool, and there'll be there would also be a, an affine term on there, right? Like a, uh, but yeah, you get the idea. So it is this this rotation. And this is obviously an arbitrary convention. I could have defined it the other way, right? Like world to body, but the body to world convention is pretty standard across robotics and aerospace and stuff. Um, mostly because we think about, you know, sensors on the robot and stuff like that. Um, the opposite convention of world to body is more standard in physics. I think because they think about, you know, I'm standing here looking down at my experiment and all of my sensors are in the world frame, say, but I don't know. Okay, so um, this thing has three degrees of freedom, like we said, but um, you can prove actually quite easily there's no global non-singular three parameter representation of attitude. So you can't write it down with three numbers without having singularities. Even though it's only three degrees of freedom. So in some sense, quaternions are like, you know, the, the most compact one that you can have because they have four parameters, right? Okay, so next thing to talk about are uh, rotation matrices, which everybody knows about and somehow my stupid thing crapped out. Apologies. All of the technology things are, are problematic. Thing takes awkwardly long time to connect also. It's working again, hooray. Okay, okay, so rotation matrices, everyone's seen these before in their lives, I'm sure. So we'll do this quick. Um, these are also sometimes called direction cosine matrices. Has anyone heard that term before? Show of hands, yes, okay. Okay, some fun facts about rotation matrices that you may not have seen before unless you like really dug into these. So when we talk about the attitude thing, we're talking about, um, and I'm gonna use this kind of one, two, three notation for the basis vectors now. So this is a matrix that's gonna map um, 
the um, sort of x in the b frame to the x in the n frame, like we said. So b and cool. Okay, so looking at this, can anyone tell me what the rows of this guy have to be? So think about it this way. When I think about matrix vector multiplication, what I'm doing is really taking the dot products between the rows of this Q matrix and the, the X over here, right? Okay, so if I look at this, like in terms of its rows, I've got three rows. Each one of these rows, if I take the first row, I'm taking the dot product between the first row and XB, and it gives me the uh, N1 component of X, like it gives me the one component of X in the N frame, right? So if you think about the definition of like basis vectors and components and stuff like that, it's the thing that gives me the sort of N1 component. So what does it have to be? Yeah. It has to be unit norm. That's absolutely true. Um, if we think about basis vectors and stuff like that, though, so the, the rows have to be mutually orthogonal. That's totally true. But they're actually a set of basis vectors. That's sort of another way of thinking about that, right? So they all have unit norm. They're all orthogonal, totally true, um, which means they are a set of three basis vectors. And it turns out the rows are a very particular set of basis vectors, if you think about this. So what I'm doing, right, is I'm taking dot products and I'm getting out the components in the end frame, right? The first row gives me the first component in the end frame. Second component gives me the, you know, the second row gives me the second component in the end frame, et cetera, et cetera. So thinking about it that way, they, the rows have to be the end frame basis vectors. Does that make sense, everybody? So this is basically, you know, if I N1 transpose, N2 transpose, N3 transpose, and specifically they're the N frame basis vectors written in the body, uh, in body, in the, written in body frame components. So it's basically how I translate back and forth, right? So the, the rows, in order for me to like legally take that dot product with the B frame, you know, components of X, they have to be expressed in the B frame and they're the N unit vectors expressed in B frame components. Okay, does everyone follow that? Does that make sense? Okay, and now sort of similarly, if I think about it the other way, the columns of this thing, uh, sort of, if you kind of think about what's going on a little bit, um, the columns are, the B frame basis vectors expressed in N components. And the way to think about that is like you're multiplying e each column here is, is multiplying one of the elements of, of the right hand side. Okay, so maybe that might take a minute to think about. There's one very obvious conclusion to draw from this fact, which we already talked about. Basically, because of this, you've, the, the columns are sort of the uh, the B frame ones, the rows of the N frame ones. And if I think about what this thing's transpose is, um, if I transpose, you know, if I do Q transpose Q, I'm taking the orth mutually orthogonal basis vectors and taking all of their dot products with each other, right? And so therefore, because they're mutually orthogonal, only the dot product of one of them with itself is gonna be non-zero, it's gonna be one because they're unit norm. All the other ones are gonna be zero. So that means that Q transpose Q equals the identity. Run cool with that. Also, by extension, then this tells me that Q inverse equals Q transpose, because that's the definition of the inverse, right? Q inverse Q equals identity. So, therefore, Q transpose equals Q inverse. This fact, where the inverse of the matrix equals its transpose, this is, uh, this is one definition for an orthogonal matrix. Um, the other one is that the columns or rows are all mutually orthogonal unit vectors or whatever. Okay, so that means orthogonal. Um, other, so the other thing we can take away from staring at this is um, we can actually infer the determinant of this matrix by, from just what we have here also. So does anyone remember like the geometric interpretation of the determinant? what it means. Like exactly, yeah, it's signed volume, right? It's the volume sort of spanned by the column vectors. Okay, so we already said the columns of this are all unit norm, unit length are all mutually orthogonal. 
So what does that volume have to be? One, right? It's one cubed, right? Okay, so knowing that, what's the determinant of one of these matrices always? Determinant one, right? Okay, cool. So you can also say this and this. Um, so it didn't have to, we said it signed volume, right? So specifically, it could have also been negative one, would have been an option. So it turns out when you define signed volume, it's the signed part is sort of referring to having a right-handed coordinate system with the right-hand rule. So if we flipped one of these around and made a left-handed coordinate system, it would come out to negative one. And in terms of like what the operation of this matrix is, that would correspond to having a reflection. So if you have reflections, you get determinant minus one. If you have a pure rotation, it's determinant positive one. So the fact that it has determinant plus one uh, is called special. If you um, in sort of matrix slash group theory lingo. So you put these together and you have um, the rotation matrices are uh, form a group that is called the special orthogonal group. And if in 3D, it's the SO3 group for special orthogonal group in three dimensions. Who's heard of this before? Cool, a lot of you, maybe. Okay, so I don't know, fun group theory. That's where that comes from. Okay, so that's sort of basic sort of facts about rotations, rotation matrices. Um, the next thing to talk about that's relevant for us because we're interested in dynamics-y things is rotation kinematics, which is specifically how we integrate angular velocity, which is well-defined, right? We all know what angular velocity is. It's what I get out of a gyro that's bolted to my robot. How do I take that gyro measurement and integrate it over time into a rotation matrix or uh, in this case, rotation matrix. Okay, so let's talk about this. There'll be sort of like a roundabout uh, way of doing this. So, okay, so I think a couple things we can start out with would be um, like the picture to think about here is like, imagine I have like a record and it's spinning with some omega and imagine I have some vector that's fixed on the record. So we'll imagine the record is the body frame. So a vector XB that's sort of defined in the body frame. And then if I look at it from above, like in the inertial frame, XN is spinning around, right? And it's time varying. Cool. So we have x n equals q of t times x b, right? So x b is a constant fixed in the body frame, right? Draw, I drew a line on the record. It's spinning around. So x in the b frame, in the record frame, not changing. x in the n frame, in the inertial frame, what I'm looking at it from above is time varying. So that q is time varying, right? Cool. So can anyone tell me from like basic, you know, mechanics the ideas what this thing is. What is the velocity of that X in the end frame when I'm looking at it from above? Not a it's an omega cross X Yeah, so it's an omega cross X, right? And, um, to be legal, all these frame things, these guys all have to be in the same frame. So it's omega cross X, right, is this velocity of the, the tip of that vector. So everyone's good with that. Okay, so now, um, equivalently, this guy, right, so I'm, I'm writing X dot in the end frame. I can also, if I tack the rotation matrix on here, I can rewrite this part in the B frame. All right, that's perfectly legal. So I can do the omega cross, whatever omega cross X in the B frame, and then I can stick the rotation matrix on it and, and transform it into the end frame. Okay, so that I think is it uh, cool for now. We're gonna need one more little thing. So, I'll, okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna apply the chain rule. So if I take the original sort of definition 
x in the n frame equals q times x in the b frame, and I just differentiate the whole thing, I will get x dot in the n frame equals q dot times x in the b frame plus q times x dot in the b frame. And we said by definition from our setup that that x dot in the b frame is zero, right? So we're going to get rid of that. Okay, so now we have, if I now take this and I plug in the x dot definition I had from just above, I'm going to get uh, x dot in the n frame. So I'm going to take this, right? So I, I have x dot in the n frame equals q dot times x in the b frame. And I'm going to take my the, the line above this where we just talked about this whole omega cross thing. I'm going to plug that in and I'm going to get q times omega in the b frame cross x in the b frame. Right? And follow that. I just took this line and this line and set these guys equal to each other. Okay, now what I can do is there's an XB on the right-hand side of both of these. I'm gonna basically pull the XB out to the right. And then what I have left is gonna be the kinematics of, of Q. Q dot equals something involving omega. That's the game plan. In order to do that, I have to define one more thing, which is this, um, this matrix that is variously called the hat map or the cross product matrix or whatever. Um, probably some of you have seen this before. So it's a matrix that's equivalent to the cross product. So if I do omega cross X, it's the same thing as having the following matrix. So this, we're going to call this uh, thing omega hat. So this is, so basically omega cross x equals omega hat times x, or omega hat is that skew symmetric three by three cross product matrix or hat matrix or whatever. So if I now plug that in, I get q dot uh, times x b equals q times omega hat times xb. And now I just pull the xb's arbitrary, any xb I want. So for that to hold, I can just take those off and say that q dot equals q times omega hat. And that is the answer. So if you want to integrate a gyro and you have some measurement of omega, if you have some initial attitude q naught that you start with at time zero, you just do this and integrate your gyro up and that should give you your, your Q of T, assuming your gyro is pretty clean and not super noisy. This is basically how you do like, you know, dead reckoning or uh, odometry on a gyro, right? Yeah. So quick question, why is it uh, using cancel over there again? Uh, sorry? Or, sorry, why is it that Q, uh, uh, Q times B X dot up there over here? Q times X dot in the body frame? Because X dot in the body frame, by definition here, we said it's like draw the line on the record. It's fixed in the body frame. Yeah, it's just pick any vec fixed vector in the body frame that you want. And it's kinematics in the inertial frame or omega cross, you know, that thing, right? That's what we're talking about. So if I just kind of product rule that out, I get that X dot in the body frame term, which has to be zero by definition. Everyone good with that? Okay, cool. Okay, so that's how you integrate gyro. Uh, so now, like from this, now I can write my dynamics of my robot with a rotation matrix in the state. I could do that using that equation, right? So I have my robot dynamics that give me like omega dot, right, in terms of various things. And I can take that omega dot and integrate that. And then I can plug the omegas into this and I can do everything in terms of rotation matrices. So we could stop there. But in practice, people don't usually use rotation matrices when they're doing dynamics and optimal control because they're so over-parameterized. Um,
So this has a lot of redundancy. So we don't like that. So, so basically quaternions are just kind of more efficient. And they're the go-to thing in you know, most areas of computer science when you're dealing with rotations. Okay, so here's how we're gonna do this. We're gonna define an axis of rotation that's gonna be a 3D unit vector that we're gonna call A for axis. And we're gonna define an angle of rotation that is the angle you're spinning about that axis. And this is a scalar with units of radians, theta. Okay, everyone good so far? So with that, we can define this um, thing that's commonly called an axis angle vector or sometimes uh, an Euler parameterization or something. I don't know, people call these different things, but basically if I just take that axis and that angle and multiply them together, A times theta, um, I get this. We're gonna call it phi. So it's just a, it's a vector whose you know, direction is the axis of rotation and whose norm is the angle with which I rotate about that angle. Does that make sense to everybody? Defining these things. And so this is a yeah, 3D vector. And it's defined such that um, norm of this thing equals theta. And if I were to do like this, the normalized, you know, axis here, we would get A back. Okay, so like one way to think about this is if I have a constant omega or a very short time, this is basically like the integral of omega in some sense, right? We said you can't really do that, but like actually with, a, with a, some approximations, it's kind of true. So that's a reasonable way to think about it. So like approximately for a short time horizon, you have this, this kind of thing. But in general, you don't wanna do this because all the singularity nonsense we talked about sort of holds. So this is like, for very short DT, this is sort of a reasonable approximation though, or very short H rather. It is true if omega is constant. Okay. So in terms of this axis angle stuff, we can define the quaternion pretty easily. So we're gonna call these quaternions little q and rotation matrix can be big Q and we're gonna write it like this. So. It's a 4D vector, and we're going to think of it as having a scalar part and a vector part, which is in analogy actually with complex numbers. We have a real part and an imaginary part. Um, so the scalar part is cos theta over 2, and we're going to put that on top. And then on the bottom, you're going to have the vector part, which is a 3D vector, and that's A, the axis, times sine theta over 2. Okay, so scalar part and vector part. Remember the whole thing is 4D. Okay, so if I'm just looking at this really quickly, you can kind of infer a few things. One is that um, from looking at this, can anyone tell me what the, the norm of this thing is? 
or thought about another way, what does Q transpose Q have to equal? Hmm? Well, A, what's A? A is norm one, right? So this thing, basically you can look at it and say A is norm one and it's sine squared plus cosine squared, which has to be one. So this thing has unit norm always. Um, so what you can say is, you know, valid rotations for this thing to be a real, you know, correspond to a physically real rotation has to be unit norm. And this is really easy to normalize numerically. So this is like one of the pros of this. Um, doing the same kind of normalization thing for a rotation matrix is way, way harder and more expensive. Okay. Um, the other thing you can get straight from this is think about what Q and minus Q look like. So it turns out if I think about Q and I think about minus Q, like, and I think about sine and cosine, minus Q corresponds to if I like um, flipped the sine of theta and the sine of A. So it turns out like Q and minus Q give me back the same rotation. They're the same, okay? And you can kind of figure that out by looking at the sines and cosines and thinking about this for a second. Um, another way to see this is by adding, if I add um, two pi to theta, I get the same physical rotation, but because of, uh, the theta is divided by two in the cos and the sine, if I plug a two pi mod two pi in there, right? I get, um, I pick up a minus sign. Everyone see that? So yeah, I'm just kind of like add two pi to this and, and take a look. Uh, so this has a name in, in group theory lingo. This is called a double cover. So there's two quaternions for every rotation, for every physical rotation. And that does kind of do weird things occasionally. Uh, it's something you occasionally have to think about in a control context. Uh, okay, and then basically the last thing I'm going to say about this is you can more or less think about quaternions. The way to think about them is just think about them like they're rotation matrices. So we're going to write a bunch of math involving quaternions, or we're going to multiply them and stuff like that. Whenever you see like quaternions getting multiplied and stuff happening to them, just pretend in your head that they're rotation matrices and all the math will work out fine. And that's kind of the right way to think about them. Um, and in some in some deep sense, that has to be true because right? they like represent the same underlying physical thing. That they're just like sort of alternative parameterizations of the same thing. Um, okay, so let's see how much time we got. We got some time. Okay, so we'll do quaternion multiplication. And people write this all kinds of weird ways. Um, I'm going to do a star for this. And we're rarely going to, you'll see also people use like an, the O time symbol for this, which I don't like because it's also chronic or product. Um, so whatever. Okay, so if I have two quaternions, Q1 times Q2, I'm going to write them in terms of their scalar and vector parts like this. Um, I can write this out in terms of the scalar and vector parts as S1, S2 minus V1 transpose V2 is the new scalar part. And then the new vector part is S1 V2 plus S2 V1 plus V1 cross V2, where that cross is the standard R3 vector cross product. As you can kind of see looking in there, like the quaternion product kind of combines into one thing, like the classic vector dot and, and cross products. And in fact, this was invented first. And then, um, so this was invented by Hamilton and then like, a few years later, Gibbs invented the standard like three R3 vector dot and cross product stuff as a supposed simplification of quaternion algebra. 
because people were freaked out by four dimensional vectors in the 1800s, apparently. Okay, so we're going to write this. So that's what it is. That's the definition. And it turns out that corresponds to multiplying two rotation matrices. Um, so if you do this with two quaternions, you're going to get the same result as if I took big Q1 times big Q2, where those were rotation matrices. We are going to write this a couple different ways, which is going to become useful when we start talking about Jacobians and derivatives and optimization. So we're going to write two different sort of matrix versions of this. I'm going to make a matrix um, that we're going to call L by pulling out. So if I look at that definition and I pull out S2, V2 to the right as a vector, I can get the following thing. Okay, so everyone see how I got that? So if I take that definition and pull out the S2, V2 terms to the right, what's left over is this matrix that's a function of you know, Q1 that when multiplied by that you know, S2, V2 vector gives me the, the multiplication operation. So we're gonna call this L of Q1 for like left multiplication, no surprise there. I can do the same thing where I pull out the S1, V1 terms to the right and get uh, a similar matrix that's going to look like this. And this one we're going to call R of Q2 for right multiplication. Question, how did I get the bottom right block of that? Why is it minus V2 hat? What happened? Yeah, I flipped the order of the cross product, which I pick up a minus sign, right? Everyone cool with that? That, by the way, the fact that the cross product flips sign when I flip the ordering, that's called being skew symmetric, right? And that's why the cross product matrix up here is a skew symmetric matrix where it's transpose equals minus itself. That's the same thing. Okay, well, uh, random fun facts then as we finish up here, we're just about done. Um, quaternion identity. Okay, so the thing corresponding to like the identity matrix, looking at that definition, what happens when theta equals zero? What do I get? Yeah, you got it. So that's the identity quaternion. Um, okay, what else? Uh, other fun thing, there's this thing called the quaternion conjugate that corresponds to with, with matrices. With rotation matrices, the transpose gives me the opposite sign, the opposite rotation gives me the inverse of the matrix, right? With quaternions, it's called the conjugate instead of transpose, but it does the same thing. So the way to think about this is plug in minus theta to that definition, and you'll find what you get is, um, and by the way, it's written as Q dagger. It's that little, I don't know, superscript dagger thing. Uh, this gives you the same scalar part, right? Because cosine, if I flip the sign on theta, cosine doesn't change, right? But if I flip the sign on the, the sign, the bottom, it flips sign. So I get the same scalar part, but I get minus the vector part. And that's going to give me the opposite rotation or like the effectively the inverse, if it were a rotation matrix or like the transpose. And we're going to also define a little matrix version of this called capital T uh, for obvious reasons that looks like one and then a minus identity block down here such that you get, you know, that, that it gives you that conjugate operation. Uh, okay. So let's see, almost there. Uh, how to rotate a vector. So this, it turns out, looks like the way you rotate a matrix with a rotation matrix. 
uh, if I have a vector, say in, in the n frame, I stick it in as the vector part of a quaternion, and then I multiply it by q, and then q conjugate. And you can also write this, right? If I, if I remember these definitions, I can write that it says L of Q, R of Q transpose times XB, or as uh, R transpose of Q, L of Q. It doesn't, the order doesn't matter. Um, the transpose there, because it turns out those L and R's, if I do the dagger on the quaternion, it corresponds to transposing the, the corresponding matrix, no surprise. Um, and this, by from this definition, this is how you you get um, the rotation matrix in terms of the quaternion. All right. Uh, let's see. What else? Last one, and then we'll call it a day. Um, oh yeah, there's sort of one little thing here. So I this thing. We're going to define another matrix H that gives such that it sort of does this. So this would be, so this basically promotes a three vector into a four dimensional vector with zero scalar part, which is what you would use to do this stuff. Last thing is quaternion kinematics. Which is um, Q dot in terms of Omega. And it's almost the same as the rotation matrix version, but you pick up the, a factor and this is easy to derive and we can do it next time, but uh, we'll throw it in there. It's the following thing. So remember with rotation matrix, it was Q times omega hat, where that was the cross product thing. Here it's Q times pure vector sort of promotion of omega, which it turns out does the same thing as the hat. Because if you go back to the definition here, if I just have a pure vector quaternion, it basically looks like a cross product in that product definition. And we can write this using our notation as one half L of Q for left multiply uh, times that H matrix that promotes the omega uh, times omega. And this whole thing here, this L times H thing is gonna be four by three, right? So it's mapping the 3D omega into a 4D Q dot. Okay, that's all you need to simulate dynamics with quaternions. So I, we, we made it to the goal for today. And we'll do some more sort of cleanup on this next time. Okay, that's it for the day. I'll hang out for a little bit. Uh, you guys are free to go. So next time we'll kind of finish up this story and like talk about optimization over returnings.